Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby Live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby. And I'm also one of your chef instructors in the courses. And uh, today's event is my office hours. And I want to thank you again uh, for taking some time out in your day uh, to join me to answer some questions. And uh, also know that uh, you know, if you want to revisit the, this program for any reason, it will be archived. And uh, so you can find that uh, access as well. Uh, on your Ruby platform. And uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into to today's program. And um, I will respond to these questions uh, as best as I can. And, um, you know, as we get started, uh, just note that, you know, if you want to participate more directly uh, by sharing a question or a comment, uh, feel free to enter that in the dialog box in the upper right hand corner of your screen and uh, then we will move forward all right here, here we go uh, first question is from louis nice to see you louis it's been uh, good corresponding with you on the side as well uh, you're making great progress in the course and you've had some fantastic questions along the way so uh, today louis is uh, asking uh, i'm curious uh, to know what uh, are five books to recommend to someone who is new to plant-based. Okay, plant-based cooking. Well, let me uh, let me see here. Uh, you know, in terms of books, uh, I'm I'm sort of surrounded by books. There's a bunch of them behind me, and I've got hundreds more uh, outside the door here, uh, on various bookshelves. But, um, you know, I have just one within reach that I'll show, uh, to sort of get this thought process going here, you know, in terms of, of, uh, uh, plant-based cooking. I mean, I, first of all, think of that as cooking in general, right? And in other words, most of the, the principles of, ingredient knowledge, handling, combinations, flavor profiles, cultural context, cooking methods, auxiliary uh, techniques that you might apply, um, and so on and so forth are really common uh, across the, the broad range of cooking. Uh, of course, as you get into uh, you know, smaller uh, areas of focus, uh, whether it's regional cuisines, as an example, uh, you're going to find particular techniques, particular traditions uh, around food handling that are unique to that culture or uh, otherwise characterize uh, the foods from that region or from that community of people. And of course, that holds true with plant-based cooking. And um, But you know, one thing I'd like to share are general references and uh, this is, you know, one of several uh, books that I've got around, but I would recommend, you know, something like this. Uh, this one happens to address herbs and spices. There are a number of different titles in this category available. Uh, this one happens to be uh, by Jill Norman. It's a DK uh, published book. Uh, this, just to show you the inside here, uh, comes with uh, some, some great color photos and handling techniques and uh, just a lot of other information. But once again, there are other similar books to choose from. Uh, you know, I always recommend uh, getting your hands on books, knives, you know, whatever, whatever it is we're talking about so that you can feel it, look at it, page through it and see if the, uh, the item is really going to fit your personality and your needs, right, as a cook. And um, uh, so, you know, for, as far as books go, if you have a chance to run down to your nearby bookseller, I always recommend that. And, um, you know, otherwise, and I think this book here uh, certainly is a good one to have on the shelf, again, or something like that, okay? Now, Beyond this particular book, uh, another reference that comes to mind uh, is a book that's called the uh, the Flavor Bible. Uh, there's also the Vegetarian Flavor Bible, which might be of more interest to you if you're going to focus on plant-based cooking. Okay, 
but nonetheless, uh, this is a, a book that uh, talks a little bit more about flavor combinations and regional flavor profiles um, uh, across a number of different food categories. And so this is a, a nice book to have around um, just to, to, to reference or to read from cover to cover, whatever your style might be. All right. Now, beyond these two specific suggestions, Louis, uh, you know, think about what other areas of the broad food world interests you and then start to drill down uh, in, into titles that uh, will be relevant right, to your immediate cooking needs. And, you know, for example, uh, one area that comes to mind, uh, you know, is international cookery or, you know, regional cuisines of the world. Uh, if you, you know, ha happen to have a particular cuisine that you're interested in, then go ahead and check out uh, titles uh, related to that part of the world. And uh, you're uh, bound to find something uh, that's plant-based uh, or certainly books that contain recipes that are plant-based or mostly plant-based, in which case you can begin to make uh, some recipe modifications and adapt them to your needs. Okay. And, uh, you know, I uh, mentioned I've got hundreds of food related books uh, around the house here and a rather small subset uh, are specifically plant-based. Um, you know, rather, uh, I've got uh, books that I'll pick up and I'll cherry pick uh, plant strong recipes and then, uh, you know, adapt those as needed. And so that's my recommendation. That's gonna make you a stronger cook uh, as you push yourself to understand the function of ingredients in recipes. Uh, in the context of making substitutions. Uh, and uh, the next step is to test recipes. Uh, that's something that I do on a fairly regular basis uh, as it relates to uh, you know, my work with Ruby. Uh, and I do that in the context of responding to student questions uh, for which I may not have an immediate answer uh, or uh, in the context of creating new recipes to publish for our recipe library here at Ruby. And that activity is a lot of fun. It is super educational. And, uh, you know, it certainly keeps me engaged in a, in a certain way and learning uh, about ingredients and interactions uh, of ingredients and flavors with time and temperature, you know, in the context of cooking. And I'm sure that you will find similar benefits. Okay. Um, you know, as far as books go, my last plug is for your public library. I'm a big fan uh, of my public library, and I'm always requesting books uh, from them for uh, pickup. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is uh, if you find a title that you're interested in and your local library doesn't carry it, uh, see if your library is part of the interlibrary loan system or network. Uh, my library is, uh, which means that I can order books uh, from all over the country uh, and uh, it's delivered you know, to my local library for pickup. Uh, and so I, so really, you know, the, uh, the card catalog, so to speak, is just much, much broader than what I actually see at the local library. So keep that in mind as a resource when you're doing your food research. Okay. Uh, above all else, uh, keep moving forward and have fun with the process. Thanks. All right. The next question uh, is from Bruce uh, regarding heating your pan. Uh, do you turn the heat down once it reaches temperature? And this is for the mercury uh, ball test, okay? Uh, or do you leave the pan temperature high? Uh, excellent question, Bruce. This is uh, definitely uh, a, a point that comes up from time to time uh, from students, uh, whether it's in their assignments or through the other avenues for asking questions here at Ruby. And uh, so... I'll begin by saying that you need to adjust the pan temperature as needed. And usually that means to cool down the pan. 
Okay. And uh, so let's talk more about that. Um, a couple of ways to cool a pan. Um, if the uh, pan is running really hot and you need to uh, act immediately, then pull the pan off the fire. Or rather than fiddling with the dial, uh, just pull the pan off the fire. Okay. Uh, and then th the next step to consider is uh, you've got your food product ready to be cooked, right? Your mise en place. That product is cooler in temperature than the pan. So once you put that in the pan, it will cool the pan temperature. So that's the, the next step to consider in that sort of uh, uh, an immediate or you know urgent situation. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, however, that there are some food items uh, you know, based upon, say, uh, sugar content or starch content or the size in which they're cut, uh, meaning very small cuts that will burn if they're placed in a really hot pan. Uh, so think about that um, and uh, don't put those items in the pan immediately. You want to let that pan cool down a little bit first. But if your food item is larger um, you know, bulkier and uh, can absorb that heat from the pan without burning, go ahead and put that in. Uh, and you're going to start to develop very quickly some nice caramelization, some nice browning on the surface. And as we know, uh, that browning equates to flavor. Uh, it also adds subtly to aroma, which also adds to flavor. And it certainly adds to the visual appeal of the food once it's plated. Okay, so those are all pluses. Um, but uh, of course, you um, still need to keep an eye on the pan temperature. So interestingly, uh, in that situation, uh, sometimes you have to turn the heat up, right? Because the, the temp was high, it dropped significantly with the addition of cool food, and then you need to bring it back up again, maybe not as high as it was, but back up into a more reasonable temperature range uh, to finish cooking the product without overcooking it or burning, right? Depending on what your requirements are, okay? Now, otherwise, let's talk about the so-called mercury ball test, right? With the, uh, the, the water droplet. Um, this uh, test works best with stainless steel cookware. Uh, because stainless steel has a particularly you know, smooth and hard surface. And uh, it really was designed and intended for stainless steel cookware. Um, you know, you can, you can use some modified version of this for other types of cookware, whether it's cast iron or earthenware or something else. But let's start with stainless steel, okay? And... Um, be patient with the process, okay, as you slowly heat the pan up. And I, I do want to emphasize slowly uh, in these first couple, three times that you're running this test. It's all about your education, right? So take your time and then uh, consecutively, right, you, you add a droplet of water, see what it does, and then wipe it dry with a towel and then continue that process as the pan heats up. And you're gonna to get to that, that um, temperature range where th the water starts doing what is described in the lesson, meaning that it, it doesn't splinter apart uh, uh, so much. It, it tends to stay together, uh, or if the pieces do bounce around individually, then they do come back together. Okay, maybe not, uh, into one clean droplet, but certainly one main droplet, sometimes with some additional small droplets at the edges. Okay, so it can look different, um, but keep that in mind. All right. Now, your next step is to get food in the pan. Okay. Um, and if you're using, uh, well, th this is this is primarily geared toward um, a no oil saute method. Okay. So you're going to get your food in the pan at that point and see what it does, see how that food acts and reacts, uh, you know, to the heat and in, in the pan, uh, and then make your adjustments uh, accordingly as we just talked about. Okay. Now, uh, throughout this whole process, 
uh, this is uh, not a passive uh, experiment, right? You are engaged. Uh, what's really important here is that you are feeling the heat uh, coming off of the pan as the pan heats up, okay? So with your hands, uh, the palms of your hands, with the backs of your hands, put your face over the pan and feel the, the radiant heat on your face, uh, and you're going to start to uh, better sense right, the temperature of the pan uh, as it goes through that, uh, that range of heating. And then you're going to correlate that heat uh, with the reaction of the food once it hits the pan. So the sizzling sound uh, and then visually what's happening, right? Is it burning, right? Is it uh, just sitting there and not doing anything, which, which indicates the pan is too cool, uh, or is it, is it uh, you know, just right, right? This is one of those Goldilocks experiments. And uh, so it really is important to do this, uh, in my opinion, a few times, right? To get to know your cookware, as well as the different types of foods that you cook on a routine basis. Uh, keeping in mind that whenever you add a new food item to this particular cooking method, this no oil, uh, relatively high temp method, you'll need to go through this process again, okay? And this is the process of learning to cook, okay? It's, uh, it's lengthy, it's repetitive, but it's a little bit different each time, and it requires 100%, right, of your concentration, okay? Um, I hope that uh, you'll give it a try, okay? And um, let's see, yeah, the last thing I wanna mention regarding the mercury reball test is that we don't intend for you to do this forever. Uh, just do this several times as needed uh, until you understand what your cookware and your food is doing, and then you don't need to do uh, this mercury ball water test anymore. All right. Thank you. All right. Next one uh, from Kimberly. Uh, in getting the mercury ball, does it first disperse all over in little bubbles before it goes to the one bubble. Um, basically, yes, uh, that is true, um, but not always perfectly, okay? Uh, I'm having a hard time getting the mercury bubble. Uh, does it act differently if the pan isn't stainless steel? Okay, yeah, so um, I addressed that briefly a second ago, and, and certainly if you're using pans that are not stainless steel, then it will not look like this. The um, you know cast iron, whether it's enameled or not, and um, tin plated, um, uh, copper, at least the, the pan that I use very often and earthenware pans, for example, uh, the water will just sputter. Okay. So you need to otherwise engage with your, your temperature sensors here and, um, just understand what's going on through repetition. Okay. So give that a, a try, uh, be patient with it. Of course, you know, this is, this is cooking. Um, I'm going to take a little tangent here uh, and uh, add a couple of thoughts. And that is that um, over the years and, and even today with Ruby students, I have a, 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 a conversation. And that is that um, cooking should be easy, or at least that's uh, seemingly you know, what many people believe. Uh, cooking is a, a mundane process, seemingly, right? We we do some sort of food prep multiple times a day, most days of our life. And uh, so it seems like, kind of like riding a bicycle, it ought to be really easy, but um, it's not necessarily. Um, if you want to learn uh, deeply and broadly about cooking and develop your skills deeply and broadly, it will take a lifetime, potentially. Uh, just depending on, you know, the, the scope of cooking that you wish to do. Um, most anybody, I think, uh, you know, can learn to cook uh, at a very fundamental level uh, pretty quickly, um, you know, such as, you know, during the duration of one of our courses. But if you want to start to fine tune, right, your knowledge and your skill, uh, it takes the accumulation of lots of experience uh, to get there. And uh, so please have uh, patience with yourself uh, and with the process. And, uh, you know, understand that, uh, you know, things like burnt food and, uh, you know, overcooked food, 
Uh, in my book, those are never mistakes. Those are always learning opportunities. And you're going to be a better cook next time. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up. Uh, I would like to start practicing the skills I have learned part-time in a restaurant setting, but only have availability for a couple of hours on the weekend. How do I approach a restaurant to inquire about an opportunity to assist with prep work? Hey, this is, uh, this is a great question. And uh, this is for uh, folks that primarily, you know, want to transition to a professional setting. Uh, and to start some work part time, or maybe transition to a, you know a full time employment in the industry. Uh, sometimes I will come across uh, uh, serious home cooks, you know, that want to simply sort of deepen their understanding and uh, up their game, uh, and so they will um, subject themselves uh, to the environment of a professional kitchen. Okay, now. Uh, the, the way to approach this, uh, generally speaking, is to uh, talk to the chef, you know, in charge, uh, figure out who that is at the restaurant that you like and you want to spend some time at. Uh, it could be the executive chef. Uh, it could be uh, a sous chef, uh, typically somebody in one of those two positions. Um, and, uh, you know, talk to them about the idea of doing a stage. And we refer to this uh, work sort of um, learning on the job experience as a stage. Um, I would recommend strongly that you uh, set yourself up uh, to do this with no pay. Okay. So you're, you're going to offer yourself um, <clears throat> Uh, as free labor, and uh, at least initially, uh, most kitchens run on a pretty tight budget. And when it comes to uh, labor, uh, the labor budget, that is one erratic area uh, of management for the chef. And the last thing she or he wants to do is to, to willy-nilly add somebody to the payroll uh, that they um, are you know, uncertain about. And so your best bet is to say, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to work for free, uh, at least for, you know, some period of time. Uh, in exchange, I'd like to learn, uh, you know, about cooking in a professional setting and let them know that you're willing to start out on the bottom rung. Um, ideally, it's prep cook, uh, you know, doing some, some, uh, some food prep of some sort. Um, but keep in mind that it, it might also mean you, you split some time assisting the dishwasher. Right. As you begin to, um, uh, you know, build some trust uh, in that network of kitchen relationships. OK. Uh, and then go from there. Uh, you know, decide for yourself uh, if that restaurant is a place that you want to continue, uh, you know, pitching in a couple hours uh, each weekend consistently and reliably for a longer period of time. Uh, or if you want to move on to the next establishment um, for whatever reason. OK, and, and, and there are many potential reasons, of course, uh, why you might choose to do that. Uh, and then, you know, over time, you know, you might also investigate the idea of uh, being put on the payroll. Right. If uh, if you're a, a, a strong contributing member of the kitchen. OK. And so figure out uh, what it is that you want uh, from the experience and then offer yourself up for free to start with. Right? Thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, the next question. Uh, happy holidays, Tamara. Uh, do you have a PDF schedule of a recommended timeline with respect to preparing a plant-based holiday dinner? No, I don't. Um, let me uh, talk through this a bit. Okay, the idea of planning a plant-based holiday dinner is uh, just like planning any other uh, holiday dinner. And uh, so if you've done it before, um, then just rely upon some of that experience that you have around time management. Okay. Um, you know, as always uh, with dinner parties and special events, uh, I recommend that the cook make dishes that they have prepared before. Okay. 
um, you know, especially as a, a, a burgeoning cook, a learning cook, um, developing your, your skills. Now, if you're an experienced cook, then uh, we might have a different conversation. Okay. But um, start out with things that you're familiar with that'll alleviate the stress. Um, that'll also shorten the prep and cooking time, um, which will be uh, greatly, I think, uh, appreciated by, by you and the diners, uh, especially when you're making what's usually an expanded menu during these special event uh, periods. Okay. Um, I am a fan of writing down my plan so that I have it in front of me on paper. And uh, it's a prep list for each dish. And I'll uh, put that in a sequence uh, that I want to follow and make any other additional notes uh, to help my process. And I always recommend that approach. Okay, so you don't forget to do things. Uh, and uh, you can you can check things off or cross things off the list uh, as you proceed. OK, so do all that you can to prepare uh, for the special event. Um, start early, you know, uh, identify dishes that um, might be served at room temperature that uh, you can get done ahead of time and just set out uh, and get those you know, off of your to do list. Uh, if there are things that you can do ahead of time, like the day before or even a couple of days before, uh, consider doing that. Uh, hold those items under refrigeration until the day of the event. And then whether it's to be served uh, chilled or at room temp, you can pull that out of the refrigerator at the best time uh, and it's done, right? Then you can focus your energy on the hot items. And uh, when it comes to the hot items, think about mise en place and what you can do ahead of time. Again, the day before, for example. Uh, sometimes it is some knife work. Um, sometimes it might be uh, preparing the components of a dish ahead of time, which will allow you very simply to finish the dish on the day of the event. Okay? And uh, then, you know, uh, figure out your timing so that you can keep hot foods hot, uh, you know, use lids, use foil, use plastic wrap, uh, and so on and so forth to your adva advantage to hold in the heat uh, to buy you time while you do other things, right? Um, you know, keep in mind that as your service time approaches, that you're going to be as busy as a one-armed wallpaper hanger getting all these details in line. OK, and so it's going to behoove you to get as much done ahead of time as possible. All right. Thank you. All right. The next question is from Peggy. Uh, are the student photos included with the lessons examples of excellent work? How, how are they selected? Uh, the student photos that you see on uh, the uh, assignment pages are uh, all of the student's work that has been submitted unless the student opts out. And you'll notice that, um, you know, as you're, you know, submitting an assignment, uh, there will be some sort of a, a checkbox that you can uncheck uh, if for some reason you don't want your a photograph displayed in the gallery. Um, but otherwise, what you see represents the work of most all of our students, uh, which means it's a mix of what you might call excellent work uh, and uh, sort of cascading down from there. Okay. So, you know, do take a, a closer look at the examples and start to discern with your own eye, uh, you know, which examples look nicer um, from different perspectives and, you know, try to, you know, emulate some of those qualities uh, if that's uh, of interest to you. Okay. And uh, yeah, I guess that, that answers your second question as well in terms of how they're selected. All right. It's an automatic process. Thank you. All right. The next question. Uh, top three favorite salty or savory snack and sweet treat 
to keep in the fridge or pantry for easy access. Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> kind of a fun question here. I could probably come up with a, a couple of things anyway. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of um, cookies, uh, among other things. But uh, very often when I make cookies, uh, I make oat cookies. And, uh, you know, once upon a time, um, I referenced the, the old uh, Better Homes and Gardens new cookbook, I think that title has been in use since um, pre-World War II, but uh, it, it, it's still the new cookbook to me. And in there is an oatmeal cookie recipe, and I've heavily modified it over the years, and I, I make it uh, plant-based today. Um, but, uh, you know, basically it's rolled oats, and um, uh, I'll bind those with... Um, usually some flaxseed meal, you know, that's been rehydrated and, and really pretty wet uh, in order to um, uh, at least lightly rehydrate the oats. And then, uh, you know, some sort of sweetener. Uh, often it's a, a brown sugar of some sort, not at the uh, published recipe quantity, but I usually cut sugar back by 50% uh, to start with uh, if I'm looking at an American cookbook. Uh, and that level of sweetness is uh, good for me uh, and those in uh, in the house here. Uh, but other times I'll try some different sweeteners. Um, I've got uh, a stash of um, whole stevia leaf uh, that I receive from India periodically. And so I uh, play with that. Um, some people don't like stevia because it has some uh, associated flavors. Uh, it is an herb after all. So if you think about that, uh, you know, any herb that we consume, uh, you know, has its characteristic herby flavor. But uh, anyway, um, so I'll try some different things regarding binders. Uh, it could be chia seed and um, sweeteners. Uh, and then I will add uh, lots of spices as well. Turmeric and black pepper and fennel and um, uh, different things. Uh, this last batch I made a couple of days ago uh, has a, a bunch of cocoa nibs. Um, you know, sometimes I'll add chocolate chips in some small quantity um, and then adjust the sugar accordingly uh, to, to, to maintain some uh, consistency uh, in that category. But um, so, uh, you know, that's something that uh, I'll keep on hand, you know, very often. Um, and um, let's see, you know, th that's mostly sweet, I guess. Uh, and then in the savory category, um, you know, I'll play around with things like um, puffed rice um, that is, uh, or, or pop, popcorn. Uh, it's not something I have on hand, but I'll make the popcorn, you know, real time and eat it. Uh, but it, but it's flavored with spices and a touch of powdered uh, citric acid or crystalline citric acid, uh, which adds a little bit of sourness. Um, so... Um, you can, you know, add or omit salt at that point. There's usually enough sort of palate interest from uh, those items. Uh, you know, in terms of spices, uh, I recommend using just a touch of oil and uh, blooming some uh, black mustard seed and then kind of go from there. It might be cumin and coriander. I like to add turmeric, a touch of black pepper, uh, sometimes a little bit of red chili powder. Uh, and then, uh, you know, toss your, your popcorn in that. Uh, and it's, um, you, know, you get the benefit of the uh, antioxidants and uh, other phytonutrients from the spices. And, uh, you know, you can control the amount of fat that you add. You can easily omit the salt. Uh, it takes just, a, you know, five minutes or something like that. So it's super convenient, super easy. Uh, and so those are a couple of ideas that come to mind. I mean, um, and otherwise, it might be the occasional carrot uh, that I uh, pull out from the, uh, the refrigerator drawer to snack on, all right? Especially if I have a bowl of hummus sitting around, okay? Hummus uh, and similar uh, bean or legume dips, uh, I think, are great to have around because they can certainly uh, then, you know, make a snack, right, along with any vegetable of your choice, all right? There, that's three. Perfect. Thank you. All right, next up. 
If uh, an FOK recipe calls for pure date syrup, is this the same as fruit paste? Now, if not, how do we make pure date syrup? Um, so let's see, date syrup, uh, first of all, if you were to go to the store, and uh, I'll run down to one of the halal stores nearby to pick up date syrup every once in a while. It comes in a jar or in a, in a can, and I'll transfer that to my own jar for storage in that case. But um, that, if I look at the ingredient list, it, it says dates, 100%. Uh, and I like single ingredient foods. Um, you can duplicate that at home. Um, by blending dates uh, and then thinning it out with enough water to get it to the consistency that you like. Okay. Um, you know, give it a try. Uh, I would expect uh, a little bit of uh, texture, uh, residual texture uh, in your home blended syrup. Um, you can always strain it if you desire. Uh, depends on how it's going to be used. Um, I try not to strain food personally because I like to use all of the the context, right? All of the fiber uh, that comes with food. Um, but uh, give that a try, right? So either buy it, right, or blend dates, uh, and then you can adjust the consistency, strain it as you desire. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question from Mary Ellen. Looking to purchase new cookware, and I'm understanding the investment necessary to get a good set. Is it possible to cook no oil with stainless? Uh, if so, can you recommend a good brand? Uh, if not, another recommendation that is non-toxic. Okay, um, so let's talk cookware, uh, at least my opinion, right? My approach to cookware. Um, for most cooks, most of the time, I do recommend stainless steel uh, because of its relative ease of maintenance. Now, certainly there are folks out there that prefer other materials, and that's fine. Um, but uh, stainless steel is super easy to take care of. It just takes a little bit of elbow grease to clean up stains, okay? Uh, you know, in terms of a, a set, there are a lot of brands to choose from, Okay. And some of those big names we're familiar with, okay? Uh, All Clad, you know, is, is an example that comes to mind. Um, and they're also spendy and, uh, you know, arguably, you know, uh, kind of too expensive, right, for, for some folks. And uh, if you're interested in something that's a little lower priced, uh, what I think of as a good value um, include the stainless steel, so not non-stick, but just traditional sort of typical stainless steel sets uh, under the Kirkland brand at Costco. Uh, and also Hinkle uh, has a set that uh, I think is a good value. And, um, you know, in years past, I've been acquainted with Tramontina. Uh, and these are all very similar, um, you know, in, in weight uh, they have, you know, la layered bonded bottoms uh, to the pans to uh, help distribute heat more evenly. And, um, you know, I would not hesitate uh, to, to use any of those uh, cook cookware sets. They tend to run between, say, 150 bucks, maybe a couple hundred dollars or so, okay? Um, and then, you know, uh, a nonstick pan is, uh, well, let me, before I get to nonstick, um, you know, as far as the higher priced brands are concerned, let's say all clad again, I've got nothing against them. Um, you know, all clad has different lines, right? Some of them are you know, lesser expensive. Some of them are relatively more expensive. Um, you know, I've used a two or three of these different lines. I don't remember the names, but they all work fine. Um, if you've got the budget to support that sort of uh, cookware, consider it. Uh, otherwise, don't feel bad. You know, I, I don't necessarily find anything um, particularly special uh, about most of those examples. Um, I, I must say I haven't used all of them, okay? But uh, I think you get um, pretty darn good performance 
um, out of some of these lower priced, uh, what I consider good value stainless steel cookware sets. Okay. Uh, I do not recommend a non-stick set because non-stick cookware, at least all the stuff that I have seen and used, will accumulate scratches over time. And at some point, they become sticky. Uh, so you need to replace them. So in other words, uh, in my opinion, uh, nonstick pans are disposable items. Uh, therefore, I recommend getting just one, maybe two uh, nonstick pans uh, according to your needs. Okay. Um, now you mentioned uh, recommendations uh, for, for non-toxic cookware. Okay. So um I am going to direct you to the interwebs. Um, consult Dr. Google and uh, read some reviews on products. Um, if, if one is uh, you know, concerned, particularly concerned about the toxicity of cookware, then uh, please take your time uh, to uh, exercise your due diligence uh, to find a product that will suit your needs. Okay. Um, my needs take me down to the nearby restaurant supply store uh, where I'll buy a pan. Uh, uh, lately, they have been uh, made by the company called Volrath, V-O-L-R-A-T-H. And um, they're an American company that makes cookware that's very commonly used in restaurants. Again, I'll pick up one, usually sometimes two, uh, and then I'll use them until I feel they're scratched up enough, and then I throw them out. Um, but uh, yeah, take the time to find uh, a, a, a technology that you're comfortable with. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Carol. Uh, let's see, do you have any book or online suggestions for beautiful creative plating? Uh, you know, nothing that comes to mind. Um, but, uh, you know, very similar to uh, the guidance that I, I provided to Louis uh, earlier in today's program, you know, I would suggest that you take a look, um, you know, ideally at your local library, um, then at your local bookstore, and then online uh, to find, uh, you know, books that, uh, first of all, touch upon the, the, the theory Right of plating, so there's there's uh, a consideration of colors and shapes and dimensions, uh, not just two, but at least that that third dimension uh, that you're working with on your canvas, um, and then uh, the book hopefully will talk about uh, you know different ingredients and cooking methods uh, that can help you create components. Uh, that will allow you to uh, design um, a presentation uh, that is doing what you're imagining, okay? Uh, and there are many books out there. Um, you know, before you invest in one, you might find that you, uh, you like two or three titles, and that's where the library or uh, just perusing the bookshelves uh, at your book uh, store uh, might be helpful, okay? But do start there, and... Um, uh, and then, you know, beyond that, you know, use other uh, photographs, other books, right, other people's work, you know, as your inspiration, as your jumping off point, uh, as you make modifications and adaptations uh, to, to suit your personality. Thank you. All right, next up again uh, from Zania. Uh, can you share some tips and perhaps share a resource for meal prepping to avoid eating the same thing all week plus food waste? Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, so meal prepping, meal planning, okay, in this case, um, you know, I recommend sitting down with a pad of paper and a pencil and doing some brainstorming. And whether that's by yourself or... Um, or with you know other members at home uh, that want to contribute uh, to the meal plan, and you you know you come up with a plan on a weekly basis, or it could even be a, a longer period than that, depending on how you want to handle it. And uh, if, first of all, think about the foods that you enjoy. 
um, you know, whether it's a, a certain regional cuisine, um, and then list those out. And then start to order them uh, in a way where you'll have common ingredients that sort of bridge one day to the next. So that if you have leftover product today, you can then use it up tomorrow. Okay. Uh, always keeping in mind that if you have some odds and ends that uh, don't fit in, uh, and they do fit in possibly to a stock production rotation, that you can always bunch those up in the freezer and then get to them uh, at some later date when you have a quantity sufficient uh, enough to make a pot of stock. Okay. Um, you know, but otherwise, uh, you know, get these things, uh, these ideas written down and then just sort of move around those puzzle pieces uh, until there's a flow that makes sense. Okay. And, uh, you know, as your, um, your skill, right, and knowledge deepen, uh, you're going to find this process to become easier and easier. Okay. Uh, but the food waste component is an important one. Uh, it certainly is uh, from my vantage point. And so, um, you know, do be smart uh, about, you know, how you dovetail the next day's menu with what you're doing today. Right. Thank you. All right. Next up again from Mary Ellen. Uh, what's the best method for roasting with no oil? I have a particularly difficult time with Brussels sprouts and asparagus. Um yeah, I mean, please, you know, please know that um, uh, roasting with no oil, you know, results in a particular style um, of uh, finished product, and it's one that's a little bit drier on the surface, uh, sometimes a little bit chewier, uh, because you don't have the fats that will crisp uh, the surface of that food item, and so you need to make that mental shift to start to, ex to expect some different results. Okay. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, the, the just those general guidelines, first of all, um, if you have larger pieces, uh, then you want to moderate the temperature, maybe start out hot in order to impart some color and then drop that temperature for the long finish. Um, or, uh, you know, the method I use, for example, for roasting sweet potatoes, which is a uh, uh, in per uh, particularly a seasonal favorite of mine during the uh, autumn and winter months, uh, is to just plop them in the oven on a sheet pan, uh, on a sill pad, typically, uh, whole, um, 350 until they're done, which is often about 90 minutes or so. And, uh, you know, by that time, there's a little bit of um, caramelization that's developed and so on and so forth. You can always cut them, put the cut side face down, so that the heat transfers, you know, through the sheet pan and um, will brown that cut edge. Um, you know, with um, smaller items uh, like uh, asparagus, you know, you might uh, crank up the heat and then reduce the roasting time and try to find that sweet spot for you. Okay. Um, now, you know, uh, you might also uh, sort of compare that against um, steaming asparagus <clears throat> to see uh, which results uh, you might like better uh, based upon what sauces uh, will accompany the finished product. Okay. And, uh, you know, those textures will vary tremendously. Uh, the degree of control that you have over roasting asparagus in particular uh, compared to, say, steaming that asparagus is tremendous. Much more control, in my opinion, with uh, steaming, but of course the results are just simply different. And so you'll need to uh, figure out what you like. Okay. There's a lot of experimentation uh, that's going to be involved um, as we start to cook foods in a very different way than what we're used to. And, you know, no oil is a very different way from what most of us are used to doing. Um, and again, a big component of that change is the mental one. Um, I'm a, 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 a deep believer, right? That life is 90% mental and the other 10% is just doing the work. Uh, you're going to run into challenges and likes and dislikes and, and uh, so on and so forth. But if you're mentally prepared, you're good for 90% uh, of that challenge. All right. So just give it a go. 
and um, experiment, take notes. I, I take notes, I recommend to my students uh, that they take notes uh, so that we can make small adjustments uh, and uh, keep on track with what it is that we've already done. Okay, have fun. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Tom is asking, have you ever looked into or tried Skinny Girl salad dressing? Someone told me about them for whole food plant-based eating. Um, I've never tried it, Tom, but I am uh, just familiar with the name. And um, uh, my understanding is that that line is a, a, a no um, added fat, added uh, oil, I believe, uh, product. Um, so definitely makes sense for a more healthful type of eating. Uh, you know, also know that as you go through our courses, um, you know, Forks Over Knives and the Pro Plant course come to mind, <clears throat> that we've, we have lessons on um, uh, salad dressings that uh, use whole food fats. So there's no added oils. And once you, uh, you know, run through the, the, that set of practice recipes, you can then expand on those as you understand the process. And uh, you can make dressings that fit this same category as Skinny Girl uh, to suit your palate to the T. All right, I hope you'll give it a try. Thank you. All right, next up is Maria. While I understand we are learning plant-based cooking, when cooking for family that are still meat eaters, do you taste broth? Um, that is totally up to you. Uh, you know, as uh, you know, I interact with our students in any of our plant-based courses, you know, I appreciate that everybody comes to this um, in a different place in their own lives. Um, and some people are going, uh, you know, cold turkey and, f uh, you know, 100% um, uh, forward. And uh, they're, they're doing the plant-based thing and they're trying to make a go at it and they're enjoying most of it and struggling with other things. Um, that while other people uh, might be simply trying to add a little more vegetable into their diet each day while they still enjoy uh, some plant-based foods. So uh, you figure out where you are sort of on that path uh, and then decide if tasting the broth is going to be acceptable to you. Um, that's going to be a personal sort of a food philosophical question and think about, um, you know, where you're coming from with respect to all of that. Okay. Um, enjoy. Thank you. All right. And another question from Maria. Uh, as I understand, I can finish the 90 day course at my pace. Does this mean that on the first day I can watch it the next morning. Uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, you know, you've got 90 days to finish the course. Um, but of course, extensions are available if necessary. Uh, but within those 90, 90 days, uh, work at your pace, slower or faster, but uh, keep the balance so that you get things done ideally within the 90 day window. Okay. And then feel free to watch videos and, uh, you know, engage with the quizzes and other activities. Uh, morning, noon, or night. Thank you. All right, Cherie is back. Good to see you. Uh, I was wondering if pre-packaged sun-dried tomatoes may be stored in the freezer. Um, yes, I mean, they certainly could. Um, you know, do keep in mind that, uh, you know, most any food uh, will experience some texture change as it goes through a freeze-thaw cycle, and even more so if that cycle is repeated, okay? Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, most food items can be frozen, um, but, uh, you know, keep in mind that um, it might uh, feel a little different in texture upon thawing. Now, something that is fundamentally dry uh, is going to have a, a better chance of coming out the other end with the least amount of change, okay? Because it is fundamentally the expansion of water during freezing that ruptures cell membranes and otherwise alters the texture of that food once it thaws, okay? Uh, but give it a try and then see how you like the results. Thank you. And then your next question. Uh, would you share a few recipe ideas of what you would use Chinese five spice blend in? 
Um, sure, uh, try it on your popcorn. Uh, that's a great place to start. And then, uh, you know, um, try it in soup, try it in stew, uh, try it in your mashed potatoes, try it on your roasted potatoes. Um, you know, try it in a vegetable medley. Um, just any of those uh, sort of routine cooking activities that you're engaged in, uh, try it out. And that's how you will learn, uh, you know, which ingredients uh, the five spice blend will pair with best. Uh, go easy to start with because uh, it's always easier to add more than it is to remove. Um, and then uh, you will be learning with each step. All right. Thank you. And let's see. The next question uh, from Estella. Uh, what, what to do if I have allergies when I feel or touch a vegetable or fruit? Um, so, I mean, you know, generally with, uh, well, let me ask, uh, answer this in a couple of, of ways, right? Um, um, I'm going to uh, assume that this is going to be within the context of uh, an assignment, okay, that you're going to submit for grading. If you have a food allergy, please reach out to us uh, ahead of time uh, to uh, figure out what the best way forward will be. In other words, what uh, is going to be a suitable substitute, okay? Now, generally speaking, um, uh, you know, we're open to um, small substitutes in recipes uh, because people can't access foods for different reasons, whether it's a food allergy uh, or they simply can't find the ingredient uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but we need to understand the learning outcomes of that assignment so that any substitution will keep you on path to meet those learning outcomes. So I suggest you reach out to us ahead of time uh, to figure that out. Um, and probably the best place to do that would be at support at ruby.com, since this would be a, a personal individualized um, consultation. Thank you. All right, Cherie is suggesting a book for Louis. Excellent, we got a little conversation going here. Uh, the Kind Diet. Um, by Alicia Silverstone. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, are buttermilk yogurt and sour cream acidic enough to preserve the pigment of blueberries in pancake batter? Okay, Alexis is asking. So, um, when we think about uh, the, the, for example, the green color, right. That, um, uh, can result, uh, that, that ring around blueberries in a muffin. Okay. Uh, that's coming from the, uh, reaction with the alkalinity of the, um, baking soda that's either in the baking soda that you're using or the baking powder that you're using as a leavener. And the idea is to, um, balance uh, that alkalinity with the addition of some acidity, okay, in that reaction to, to neutralize that reaction. And then that sort of keeps the blueberries out of the, rea the reaction and maintains their uh, beautiful purple color. Uh, and so the quick answer is uh, yes, right? Those items do provide acidity. Uh, and in fact, we often see uh, the addition of these ingredients in a, a muffin recipe uh, for that reason. Um, keep an open mind, okay? Uh, sometimes in order to fine tune the, our desired results, uh, we will need to do some experimentation. So uh, as uh, I always do, I recommend taking notes whenever you make alterations to a recipe so that uh, we can move down the path of greater knowledge, All right? Thank you. Okay, and uh, from Luis, any practical differences between a stainless steel frying pan and a cast iron skillet, especially for searing and cooking steaks and chicken? Uh, I know I should use <clears throat> uh, stainless steel if I wanted to make a sauce using uh, caramelized bits in the pan, but anything else besides that? 
Uh, you know, the, the biggest difference, generally speaking, is that with uh, cast iron, you know, you've got the ability to really surround that food with um, heavier radiant heat, um, including from the top, right, as you place that uh, heavy lid uh, on the pan, if, if, if that's the situation. Um, and uh, so there's... There's a difference uh, in heat penetration uh, all around the food, um, you know, as well as uh, the way that the heat is tempered uh, coming through the pan to the food. Um, now, you know, in terms of the practicality, there's a little bit of hair splitting here, okay? I mean, on, on one hand, most of what I just mentioned uh, runs along the lines of, of a, a personal aesthetic preference, okay? Although some of it overlaps into sort of the, um, the actual function of cooking, right? When it comes to uh, greater heat that's trapped in the heavier metal of the cast iron and how it radiates toward the food, that's not just an aesthetic, right? That's a... Um, that's a, that's, that's, uh, that's science, right? There, that's a real uh, difference coming out of that different technology, although the results are aesthetic, right? That we are finally judging as a cook, chef, or consumer. Um, so uh, th then the second part of your, your uh, uh, question here is regarding the little caramelized bits in the pan. Well, you know, those will be left over uh, in any pan that you use, including uh, the heavier, uh, cast iron skillet. Uh, so always try to pick those up by deglazing and uh, just use whatever uh, liquid is uh, best for you. Uh, ideally, it's a flavorful liquid like a stock, uh, but it could certainly be wine or if you're staying clear of uh, alcohol, then water is fine as well. Sometimes apple juice, uh, if a little bit of sweetener uh, is appropriate for your finished products. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, you know, give it a try, okay, with these two types of cookware and compare these technologies. And, um, you know, you're going to learn a lot from that experimentation and you'll figure out what you like better. And you might decide that you like one type of cookware for certain types of foods and a different type of cookware for other types of foods. Um, and, you know, just uh, as an aside, you know, uh, we've got a kitchen full of all kinds of cookware of different materials, uh, glazed and unglazed earthenware. We have rock, like, you know, stone, um, stainless steel clad copper, tin clad copper, uh, enameled and non-enameled uh, 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 cast iron and stainless steel and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so give it a try and uh, see what you prefer. Thank you. All right. Uh, so Harini is asking, do you include any low FODMAP or nightshade free recipes? So um, in our, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'll say that in our pro plant course, we have a lesson uh, that will look at some of these uh, um, uh, health concerns and uh, alternative ways of creating uh, a menu or a diet. Uh, and it, it also addresses um, FODMAPs, okay? And the idea is to uh, open your awareness on how you might modify a recipe to suit your particular need or that of your clientele, okay? Now, in terms of um, recipes, um, you know, offhand, I can't cite any um, FODMAP-free recipes, okay? Um, so I'll kind of leave it at that. All right. Thank you. Next up, another question from Xenia. Uh, in a cookie or muffin recipe, can we replace brown sugar with coconut sugar? Equal parts. Uh, does coconut sugar burn faster? I think that might have happened in my last batch. How about replacing brown sugar with dates in baked goods? Ah, okay. Wow. Got a series of great uh, uh, um, uh, questions here. So let's uh, kind of pick them off here. Um, so can you replace brown sugar with coconut sugar? I mean, the, the quick answer is yes. Um, now when it comes to things like cookies and muffins, um, 
my approach is with a very open mind because I will eat anything and uh, whatever cookies I make or probably muffins that you make, I would enjoy eating uh, regardless of what sweetener is used. Okay. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, so my answer is yes, you can, you can swap in and out, uh, sweeteners, uh, and really be within an acceptable zone of sweetness in my opinion. And then beyond that, it, it will require some fine tuning on your part, uh, to get that result to just where you want it to be. Okay. Um, start with equal parts and then see how you like it and then and then go from there. Uh, does uh, date uh, does coconut sugar burn faster? Offhand, I don't know. okay so uh, you know give that a try. It sounds like you've got some experience. Uh, take notes, okay? Uh, adjust quantity, uh, keeping temperature the same and the baking duration the same. Uh, adjust the uh, quantity of your sweetener or the ratio if you're mixing sweeteners, which is fine to do, uh, and then uh, uh, move forward, okay, you, you know, with your uh, experimentation. And then lastly, how about uh, replacing brown sugar with dates and baked goods? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, dates on their own uh, provide lots of uh, sweetness. Uh, do keep in mind that the sensation on the palate will be different because instead of an even distribution of sweetness through every bite, you will have little nuggets of sweetness that you bite into upon which that sweetness is distributed across the palate through your saliva or other liquid introduced to your mouth. Okay. And so it's a little bit different experience, even though uh, it can be equally satisfying in a different sort of way. Okay. So give that a try. And again, think about uh, what it is that you want. This is very interesting, I think, because um, food cooking, as well as the whole connection with eating is an intellectual activity as far as I'm concerned. And you can create very different experiences at the dinner table um, by altering things like the sweetener that you use. Okay. And so this is a, a very interesting question or set of questions that you ask. Um, so uh, try these experiments, um, you know, with great engagement and then see what you get as results. Thank you. All right. Last up from Luis again. Uh, can I still use a stock that didn't form the gelatin? I suspect I added too much water in my last batch and I didn't want to throw it out. Uh, great question. Uh, I love this topic. So let's talk about stock, uh, bone stock, right? Whether it's chicken or beef or lamb or turkey or fish or something else. Okay. But, um, bone stock, okay. Uh, this idea of extracting gelatin, right? Which comes from the breakdown of collagen, which is a primary connective tissue in all of our bodies. Okay. Vegetable stock doesn't have this. So talking about bone stock, um, it is uh, a, a, a factor of uh, a few things, just a few, temperature. So we need to bring that pot of liquid up to a moderate simmer, maybe a gentle simmer. Well, let's say a moderate simmer because uh, sometimes I see a, a simmer that is really too gentle uh, and it's... Um, uh, it, it's, it's just not going to break down the collagen and draw that out into the liquid quickly enough. Okay. So a, a moderate simmer, um, you know, which is going to be a, a simmer I think of as in the temperature range of 185 to 205 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're seeing some, um, some moderate bubbling on the surface, very often in one location, okay? Um, but not a full-on boil, which is much more aggressive with violent bubbles breaking the surface, okay? So you don't want that. Um, now, time is another factor. If you're talking about a smaller yield of stock, okay, let's say, um, you know, upwards of a couple of quarts, a couple of liters, okay, maybe one, one and a half to two quarts, then two and a half hours or so uh, is usually enough time to draw out 
uh, gelatin in a noticeable fashion. Now, the longer your simmering time, um, you know, maybe up to four hours or so is going to be quite adequate uh, to pull out sufficient gelatin and flavor uh, for your end product. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing is uh, your water ratio uh, relative to the bones. And uh, clearly, uh, if the water uh, is in abundance, uh, then your finished stock will be rather thin, although it might be adequately flavorful. Certainly, it has value at that point. I wouldn't discard it, um, but it might be thin uh, once it's chilled. And if you want more body from the gelatin, it's simply a matter of reducing the stock. Okay, so you've strained it and you have just the clear liquid, uh, go ahead and put it back on the fire and reduce it over a, a gentle to moderate simmer uh, in order to concentrate the gelatin. And you're going to find a, a, a place, right, that, um, that zone uh, where the gelatin is going to be acceptable to you, depending on what it is that you want to do, whether you're making a, a, a sauce right, or a soup or something else, okay? Uh, and the way to test that is to draw out a small portion of the stock uh, into uh, just a small portion. It might be a couple of tablespoons, uh, you know, into a, a bowl and then place that in, uh, uh, in the refrigerator or if you want to speed up the process, put it in the, in the freezer for just a few minutes to, to chill, not freeze, but just to chill it uh, and then give it a little jiggle. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, put it in your mouth in order to see how that feels. I mean, ultimately, it's that viscosity, right, that you're after. Uh, and then you can look at the uh, flavor and aroma at the same time. Okay. And uh, so those are the factors that I consider uh, that I always look at uh, when my students are making stock in the kitchen and uh, the sort of troubleshooting feedback that we go through. Okay. Um, and then also note uh, with stock, if you just keep on reducing it, you can really concentrate the uh, gelatin and you can make a gloss, right? That's how we get to that point. And when you get to, uh, well, let me, let me first say that you can, of course, freeze stock, which I always recommend. Uh, then you've got a, a flavorful liquid that you can pull out. Uh, freeze it in units that are convenient to you, whether it's a pint or a quart or something else, for example. Um, but if you uh, further reduce that to create a gloss, uh, which can be very, very thick uh, when it sets up, I mean like an eraser thick uh, when it sets up uh, cold, um, then you can store those in uh, even smaller units, like in an ice cube tray. Uh, and then you can pop those out into a, a Ziploc bag, and then you can store those small, um, uh, essentially it's a, a bouillon cube at that point. And then you can plop that into a, a pot of soup or stew uh, to finish with a little hit of flavor. Uh, but please note uh, that as you further reduce the stock on its way to a glass, uh, that you'll want to... Uh, put that smaller amount of liquid into smaller pans um, and then lower the heat so the process is more and more gentle because uh, it will burn very, very quickly uh, if it has great surface area, um, you know, when you have a small amount in a large pan, okay? So give that a try, have fun with it, okay? And then uh, tell me how it uh, turns out, okay? And I see we're at the end of our questions here. Uh, if any of you have uh, any other questions, please reach out uh, at support at ruby.com. I'd be happy to answer your questions, okay? Uh, and until we meet again, happy cooking.